no, 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 oh. me. Oh. <laughs> All right. Why do you want to get this? Because I have to Oh, you're looking to get into a fight. Oh. Oh. So should I? No, no, you want to pick me. Yeah. We're large. You want to get first. Okay, so. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Howard Hawkins. I'm running for president with the Green Party. We need like 200,000 votes in New York. We got a bunch of folks from the Bronx and New York City here today. But we got a whole program. So Deborah Rosario from the Bronx Greens with the best green t-shirt in the nation yeah. <laughs> is going to introduce Margaret Kimberly, who has written a book on the presidents called Presidential. And you read that book, you know why we need to get some greens up in there. So take away. Well, Margaret Kimberly, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. And I read. 90% of your book, uh -huh. <laughs> lost it and had to go buy another one and then find my old, found my old book. But uh, I'm very happy you're here. I learned a lot about uh, what I wasn't taught in school. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very, uh, it was very moving because I, I just been lied to my whole life. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so um, if anyone doesn't know about Margaret, Margaret is a author and columnist for the um the black agenda report and she's written numerous books about the uh, uh, history of the united states and history that that's not taught in school margaret would you like to talk a little bit more about your your new book sure i I'm, i also want to add i'm a new york state green yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you thank you so much um it's always great to be in the Bronx. I'm, I'm not too far away. I'm, I live in Manhattan. Don't hold it against me, though. Um, but I love coming here. And uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here with Howie Hawkins and to be here for a Green Party event. So I'd like to, of course, um, talk about my book, Presidential, Black American, the President, um, and um, bring that story into the present. Day. Uh, my book is a collection of essays, 45 essays, one for each president, um, which analyzes the history of the presidents and their relations with and treatment of, of Black people in this country. It's a sad story, but there's a lot to be learned. Um, that despite what Trump said, I don't know if you're aware, a couple of days ago, Trump gave a speech and uh, uh, he wants to promote patriotic education, and which is what we've always had. I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, I didn't learn any of this in school. But um, uh, anyway, I will go. I'm going to read a little bit from the book. And I'm also going to read from uh, my column in Black Agenda Report this week um, about uh, uh, climate change, uh, the fires, the terrible fires in the West have uh, brought that issue to the forefront again. So this is uh, the preface to my book. The very first words is a, uh, are a, uh, it's a quote from the great W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the great uh, American scholars. And he said this in 1956. In 1956, I shall not go to the polls. I have not registered. I believe that democracy has so far disappeared in the United States that no two evils exist. There is but one evil party with two names and it will be elected despite all I can do or say. And uh, here we are uh, 60 some odd years later and we're still being told about uh, lesser evilism. I don't know why anybody is bragging about evil um, uh, so I, I don't know if, if people realize what they're saying when uh, they try to make that case. But then, as now, we have an, an oligarchy in this country that, um, that controls our lives. And more so now than in the 50s. Du Bois actually became a Marxist. He died outside of this country in exile in Ghana. Um, he had been persecuted. During the McCarthy era, like Paul Robeson, they'd taken his passport at, at one point. But um, all these years later, where are we? Um, in uh, the book, I uh, detail how the founding of this country has brought us to where we are today. This is a settler colonial state built on uh, genocide of uh, indigenous people 
of um, chattel slavery. Um, 10 of the first 12 presidents were slaveholders. That tells you um, quite a lot about this country. Um, the city of Washington, D.C., I was always taught they built this city. And uh, uh, of course, later on, I said, well, why would you need a new city? You need a new city if you want to make sure it's safely within the bounds of the slaveholding states. So, of course, you build a new city on a swamp between Maryland and Virginia, because if Philadelphia is the capital, which it was briefly when Washington was president, and uh, Philadelphia had a law that said any enslaved person in the state for six months would be freed, uh, the president had a problem. And so he hid enslaved people. He rotated them back and forth to make sure that none of them were ever free, not even one. One young lady managed to escape from Washington's household uh, and got all the way to New Hampshire, and the Washingtons never <laughs> gave up trying to recapture her, although she succeeded in maintaining her freedom. Um, we go forward into uh, the years of, of uh, uh, further expansion of the United States, displacement of indigenous people, and finally, we get to the Civil War. Uh, and then we have presidents like Abraham Lincoln. We're taught he is the great liberator. In fact, he wanted uh, to get black people out of the country. And he wanted to tie emancipation to these colonization schemes to uh, literally drive black people away. Uh, at that point in history, we uh, the Republican Party was started with Lincoln. They were. <coughs> committed to um, fighting the expansion of slavery, not ending it. But um, uh, so at that point, black Americans, uh, black men had the right to vote after in some places after the Civil War. And um, the Republican Party was the preferred party. It was the black people's party. And this is a dynamic we see in history where there's a white party and a black party. And at that time, the Democrats were the party of the segregated South, and the Republicans were the party of Lincoln. So throughout the late 1800s, black people constantly argued in favor of Republicans uh, because they were not the party of the segregated South. Um, and then as we go further into history, we see that change uh, <laughs> in the 60s. Uh, at the time of the civil rights movement, and the Democrats become the Black People's Party. The Republicans become the White People's Party. 90% of Black people give their votes to the Democrats. Most white people give their votes to Republicans. And uh, this is, we can see this being problematic. Even presidents who we were told were good for Black people, as uh, people usually older than I uh, describe them. So FDR, Roosevelt, is uh, supposed to have been this great champion. And he was a... Um, uh, a president who did change history, but he would never fight for black people. He never made an effort, for example, to pass uh, legislation against lynching Democrats, Republicans. None of them responded. Uh, we go uh, into the 60s, even people as late as John Kennedy. John Kennedy, well, Bobby Kennedy especially, hated the March on Washington. They did not want uh, the Kennedy family to be connected with the black struggle for rights. Uh, he's another one who used the excuse of uh, needing the support of Southerners. Um, Johnson was the one who was president when the movement reached its zenith, shall we say. And I, I think it's important for people to, um, to acknowledge the struggle, the struggle of the people instead of giving these people credit, these uh, politicians credit for having done this or that good thing, uh, let's talk about what the people did. And especially the civil rights era, people uh, fetishize it and, and go on and on and Edmund Pettus Bridge and I have a dream speech, but nobody talks about, or not often enough, about what the people did. The people made clear demands, they moved in mass, they did not give up. They challenged the political system knowing that the system did not want to accede to their demands, but they did not care. Being friendly with presidents was not on the agenda. 
getting um, uh, their rights, getting their human rights respected was on the agenda. And that is what, if, any, if it can be said that the system has given us good things, that is why it happened. Um, but now, in the 21st century, it's been a long time since that was the case. And now we have uh, these same two, uh, the duopoly, at work again, but we, with a weakened movement. And that's uh, a longer story. So now what do we have? We have, um, we're constantly told about this lesser evil. Uh, we have um, no party that stands for working people. They don't even go through the motions anymore. The Democrats um, get undeserved praise uh, for things that um, uh, they were forced to do by popular demand decades ago. Um, we see this play out now. Uh, the last, excuse me, couple of weeks, we saw these terrible fires in the west, in the western states, and um, I was uh, inspired to write my column in Black Agenda Report, uh, and I called it "Democrats' Climate Change Lies." Um, and I was inspired to do it when I saw a tweet from uh, former President Obama with pictures of the orange skies and saying, vote like your life depends on it, because it does. So it's, this is going to take me just a few minutes, but I'm, I'm going to read through this, um, which will explain why it's so important to support the Green Party. In recent weeks, a combination of drought and record-breaking heat have accelerated wildfire season to historic levels of devastation. More than 4.6 million acres have burned in the states of California, Oregon, and Washington. Skies are colored orange and red. The air is unbreathable. Lives have been lost and entire towns have been destroyed. The connection between heat waves, droughts, and human-made climate change are clear. And the solution is known to every school child. There must be a drastic reduction in the production of fossil fuels. <coughs> a radical restructuring of society, especially an end to capitalist incentives for planetary destruction is no longer optional. Every form of plant and animal life is in very grave danger. It's easy to blame Donald Trump, who among other things withdrew from the 2015 Paris Climate Accord. Although it must be pointed out that the agreement is an honor system uh, honor system based declaration of intent and not a requirement to take action. Signatory nations chose goals for themselves while also allowing temperature increases that are deadly for people living in the global south. The agreement specifically states that industrialized nations don't have to pay compensation for the damage they do to the rest of the world. Trump's stunt gives the impression that Democrats are serious about fighting climate change, but the facts prove otherwise. Barack Obama recently took to Twitter with photos of orange California skies and implored voters to act. Quote, protecting our planet, our planet is on the ballot. Vote like your life depends on it, because it does, unquote. He didn't say who voters should support. One assumes he meant the Democrats, but they have turned their backs on their own timid, mealy-mouthed proclamation of concern. The Democratic National Committee removed language from its platform, which called for ending government subsidies to fossil fuel companies. That betrayal was just as well, because the Democrats' record on the environment is nothing like the image they pro project on social media. Obama was joined by California's Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom who used some of the same photos and offered the same platitudes with capital letters for extra emphasis. Climate change is real, so please vote. Obama and Newsom are both liars. This is what Obama said in a March 2012 speech. Quote, now under my administration, America is producing more oil today than at any time in the last eight years. That's important to know. Over the last three years, I've directed my administration to open up millions of acres for gas and oil exploration across 23 different states. We've opened up more than 75% of our potential oil resources offshore. We've quadrupled the number of operating rigs to a record high. 
We've added enough new oil and gas pipelines to circle the earth and then some, unquote. Newsom is no better. Despite the social media rhetoric, his administration continues to give fracking and other drilling permits. In fact, the state of California has given more fracking permits in the first six months of 2020 than it did in the same period the year before. Neither of the two capitalist parties is in any position to stop the planet from heating up. That is because they both do the bidding of the corporations causing the record-breaking temperatures to occur. One party lies about the damage it is causing and promotes easily dismissed quackery to defend itself. As usual, the Democrats sneer and pretend to act differently when at every opportunity they do the very same thing same things that are killing the planet. Our lives do depend on bringing about change, but that won't ha happen if Biden is the man in the White House. Supposedly progressive Democrats stole the language of the Green Party, the party they otherwise scorn and claim they will institute a Green New Deal. But the Democrats who promote a watered down version are openly thwarted by their leadership. Their progressive wing is not serious, and the establishment doesn't even pretend until the West Coast, West Coast is ablaze and then pretense is all they have. Climate change did not begin after Donald Trump was inaugurated. The damage was done by Democrats and Republicans, by the United States and by every industrialized nation that bowed to the dictates of capital. Obama and Newsom and all the rest hope we aren't paying attention when their handiwork provides, produces a natural disaster. Pretending that one wing of the duopoly will behave differently than it has in the past is adding insult to one's own injury. The least we can do is call out the scoundrels when they tell us lies as the sky turns red. Um, I think I just made a case for voting for Howie Hawkins and Angela Walker. Yeah, yeah. And um, Green Party candidates all over the country. You know, this week, especially in the last last 24 hours, um, um, it was uh, announced that um, uh, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg had, had passed away. And um, people are in mourning. I'm not saying they should not be for her. Uh, progressives are upset. What will this mean for the election? This is why you have to uh, have Democrats in office. But I, I think it's important to talk about how um, uh, the situation ended up as uh, where we are now. Not only did Justice Ginsburg herself fail to leave office when she first became ill, when Obama was still president, but the Democrats did not take seriously keeping those seats, which they always claim are all important. What are we always told if someone doesn't want to vote for a Democrat? But the Supreme Court, what about the Supreme Court? Well, they didn't care about it that much. When Obama was president, uh, they lost, the Democrats lost 900 seats in Congress and state legislatures across the country. Everything from redistricting, gerrymandering, uh, choice of judges uh, at every level of government were all at stake. But all they want to do is raise money and cut deals and get someone in the White House so they can cut the best deals. And if people are going to talk about where we are now, they could, should talk about the fact that Democrats, some of them have gone on record to lament that they didn't fight hard enough for Merrick Garland in 2016 after uh, Scalia passed away. So uh, this is not the party to hang on to. Uh, we ha are at a really desperate situation in this country and in the world. Everything from climate change, we can see from uh, COVID-19, this uh, pandemic that has uh, created, well, not created, exposed an economic crisis that was already in the making. Um, you, you cannot complain about these issues and then vote for people who tell you, we're not going to have Medicare for all. You're not going to get free health care in a pandemic. Um, it, is, it is vital that people start tearing up what is already um, long gone. 
and look to um, a, a new solution, namely that of supporting a real people's party, a real workers party, a real peace party, and not uh, a, a group of people who uh, stab you in the front. So um, I am a Green. I am proud to be a Green. I'm proud to support the Hawkins Walker ticket. I'm proud to support Greens all over the country. Uh, and I implore everyone to do as well and not to succumb to lies and uh, efforts to frighten you uh, by offering you the same solutions which have uh, uh, gotten us into the situation that we are in today. So, vote green. Vote in soccer. going on since the beginning of this country yeah. and um, especially here in the Bronx right mm -hmm. we had the highest um, death of, of COVID-19 um, of death um, and pretty much Democrats hold this um, this borough right mm -hmm. um, it's I think it's very important for people to know that there's just another alternative most of the um, politicians here in the Bronx have been have held office for 30 years, mm -hmm. and some of them, many of them, don't even live here. They they have like an apartment as a as a as a paper residence, and they live somewhere else in the suburbs. So, um, so I, I for me, it is very important that we support the Green Party, and we and that people in the Bronx have a a. a, a uh, another choice, <laughs> you know. We need to break uh, this um, uh, two-party system, and I wouldn't even call it a two-party. I call it a one-party system. It is. Yeah. It's a one-party system. So. Yeah, it's the you know, it's I I talked about uh, uh, the environmental issues, but we can talk about so many things. There was a proposal to cut the military budget just 10% and it failed. Democrats joined Republicans. We have a defense budget, I, I think it's almost 60% of discretionary spending. Yeah. And it's why we cannot have nice things, and literally. Yeah. Um, but it, it starts at, it's not just in Washington, it's important at the local yeah. level to talk about people's needs, to legalize marijuana. These Democrats, um, we have uh, uh, finally the Democrats control both houses in Albany, and we have a Democratic governor, but it's Andrew Cuomo, not really a Democrat. And uh, we still have uh, criminalization, which feeds into the uh, mass incarceration system. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a lot to do here. There's a lot. There's something very uh, dangerous that started recently. The NYPD has started working with the FBI. Mm -hmm. So ordinary crimes, let's say a shooting, are now being referred to the FBI. This is extremely dangerous. And I expect the uh, Democrats who go on and on about Trump being a fascist, mm -hmm. well, let them act on it because that, that is fascism. And we need them to take action on that and many other issues and uh, not to be satisfied with being a, I don't even know what a lesser evil is, it's still evil, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we have to have uh, a, a new system and it has to, um, the electoral system has to be an important part of that. Yeah, that's true. Does anyone have any um, questions? Um, questions from the audience? I'd like to ask um, Margaret, Fred. Yeah. One thing bothers me deeply and profoundly all the Michael Moore, Noam Chomsky, Chen Hightower mm. meetings, 
say tax the rich, they're not paying their fair share. Tax large corporations, they're not paying the fair share. Tax a 1%. Sometimes I can get mad with people even when, when I don't, when I, when I agree with them. I never hear any of the aforementioned talk about taxing churches and synagogues. I'm not talking about the small storefront church in Harlem or, 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 or South South of Queens. I'm talking. I'm thinking Cathedral St. John the Divine, St. Patrick's Cathedral, St. Temple Emmanuel. <laughs> Their wealth is incredible. Yeah. Look at the artwork in the Vatican. For every Martin Luther King, there's a 20, 30 Bible thumping, you know, traditional values, same sex marriage, pro life, you know, idiots. It profound, it's deeply disturbing that I never hear anybody talking about taxing churches and synagogues. <laughs> or to put it another way, I wonder when the hell AOC is ever going to talk about abolishing prayer in public schools. Well, well, they, I, they, they are abolished. <laughs> they are, there's no prayer in public school, yeah, not yeah. since the 60s. Yeah. But I, I just want to say houses of worship are nonprofits. And I don't, if we're going to talk about taxing nonprofits, you could talk about the other extreme, how Harvard University having a $40 oh, yeah. billion dollar endowment. Uh, I, I happen to believe that those nonprofits, there has to be some kind of way oh, yeah. uh, for well, them the to uh, provide. Um, they get a lot of public resources and they should provide. I'm personally not at all concerned with houses of worship uh, or other nonprofits um, uh, being, being tax exempt. That's not an issue for me. I, I really think the issue of uh, this great wealth where Jeff Bezos could be the first trillionaire is uh, the problem where the, I don't know, five or six richest people have as much wealth as like the other half of humanity. Um, uh, they, they do need to be taxed. We need real progressive taxation, which we had until recently. And that's another thing. Um, the Bush tax cuts for the rich were supposed to be temporary, and then Obama made them uh, permanent. And now the Democrats are saying, if Biden becomes president, well, we were talking about that, but actually not so much. So uh, that is actually a, another issue for the people. Um, we have one more question here. Yeah, I just was hoping you could comment about um, the criminalization of communities and mass incarceration and the new Jim Crow. Uh, criminal, mass incarceration, yeah. Um, we shouldn't have that. Uh, you know, I read, I was asked to write about changes since Martin Luther King was alive. When King was alive, there was something like 600,000 people incarcerated in the entire country. Now there are more than 2 million. Uh, half of those people are black. Black prisoners make up 25% of everybody incarcerated on the planet. Um, we have to, people have been talking about um, defunding the police or abolishing the police. We need community control of the police. We need the ability to hire, to fire, to set policing policy, to um, set policy in the carceral state. People are, excuse me, are um, the, the wildfires in California. Incarcerated people are a lot of those firefighters. And uh, the governor passed some tepid bill, which gives them the ability to ask permission to be a firefighter and let a judge will decide if they can do so once their sentence is finished. It's, it's not uh, very much. So that is just an example of uh, the prison industrial complex. And it all starts with um, the police on the beat um, who interact with people, who work with the um, uh, district attorneys, the prosecutors who are very cozy with them. So, of course, when the police kill someone, they don't want to make them pay. So this is uh, an area where we need community controls. Um, do you have any more questions? Okay, good. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you. American Memorial Market. And once again, please donate to the local Yeah. Yeah. And on the phones or something, how do people donate? Uh, yeah, you could uh, donate in uh, Howie Hawkins' uh, website, and I think uh, it should be um, it should be on the live stream in okay. his website. Um, 
Could you show your book? One more time, yeah. <laughs> Presidential, Black America and the President. Yeah. You can get it from the publisher, Steerforth Press, that's steerforth.com, from Amazon, from Barnes & Noble, from your local bookstore, bookshop.org. Get books from your local independent bookstore. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I'm pleased to introduce Howie Hawkins, the Green um, candidate for president. Yay! Yay! The working man, or working person's um, um, president, and we need to put a working person in the White House. Howie Hawkins. You know, Margaret was quoting uh, Barack Obama, vote like your life depends on it, because it does. Does that sound familiar to people? Yep. Yeah. I mean, that was Jill Stein every speech in 2016. I mean, these Democrats are shameless. You know, they, they talk about the Green New Deal like we haven't been talking about it for a decade. And what did they do with it? watered it down right. right by the time it got into congress as a non-binding green new deal they eliminated the most essential immediate demand a ban on fracking the new fossil fuel infrastructure they eliminated the phase out of nuclear power dangerous dirty uneconomical nukes that cost two or three times more than most forms of solar and wind energy and aoc is now pro nuclear nuclear movement for 50 years she needs to sit down and talk to me because she's on the wrong track. They eliminated the deep cuts in military spending to help fund the Green New Deal. And they extended the deadline from 2030 to 2050 to zero out carbon emissions. They need to talk to Greta Thunberg. What did she tell the, the uh, UN? The last report from the International Panel on Climate Change said we got 420 gigatons carbon budget left before we blow through 1.5 degrees Celsius rise. And we're emitting 42 gigatons carbon a year. We got eight years left. Yeah, Trump calls climate change a hoax, but Joe Biden and the Democrats act like it's a hoax. So we're in big trouble. Now, when I started this campaign, you know, it took a while to like frame it down. You're supposed to run on three issues because people can't keep 30 issues in mind, even though we got 30 issues. So we settled on three life or death issues. The climate meltdown. And that's the Green New Deal. That was the Green Party signature issue in the last decade. We're talking about 100% clean energy and zero to negative carbon emissions in a decade. We call it an eco-socialist Green New Deal because the only way we can do that is to do the kind of thing we did during World War II. When the federal government took over and plan production in a quarter of the manufacturing sector in order to turn industry on a dime into the arsenal of democracy to arm the allies against the fascist axis power we need to do nothing less to defeat climate change in the next decade it means we need a public energy system we need a public transportation system from the airlines to the old trolleys every city used to have the light rail and in between freight high-speed bullet trains instead of air travel for intermediate and short range inner city travel and in the manufacturing sector because we don't only have to produce electricity with renewables we got to have inner every production system in the economy not be emitting greenhouse gases that means all the manufacturing all the agriculture transportation and buildings all the sectors have to be transformed and it's got to be done through the public sector to coordinate these interrelated systems of production. So like, just take cement. That accounts for 5% of the world's carbon footprint because it's all Portland cement. And when they put the calcium carbonate in there, heat it up, the calcium hardens the cement, but the carbonate goes into the atmosphere. So we need a new way of making cement. And we know how to do that. Steel, electric arc furnaces instead of coke ovens. And we can go across all the different technologies, but that's not gonna happen with a few incentives 
and standards and mandates because industries are going to fight it like they always do. We can't fuss around with them fighting regulations. We got to take them over and run them in the public interest under community and worker control. It's the only way. We're in a crisis. We can't play around with fussing with capitalism. Because capitalism is a system of endless growth, which is incompatible with a finite planet. And if we don't face up to that and talk about that and bring that in the elections from top to bottom, we're not being serious. So that was the first issue. The second was the growing inequality. It's been growing in this country for the last 45 years because of stagnant wages and the cost of living, particularly housing, health care, and college going up. So people's life uh, expectancies in the working class have been in decline. We repeat that life expectancy in the working class in this country are in decline. They call them deaths of despair. And you know, some people aren't taking care of themselves. There's obesity, but there's alcoholism. We got all these opioid deaths. People are turning to drugs to cope with disappointments in their lives. They're committing suicide. That's what's caused life expectancies to decline. Or people got to choose between: Am I going to pay my utility bill at the end of winter, or am I going to buy? my kidney medicine that Medicaid told me I needed and I've been buying, but now I'm in this hole. That's what happened to a 60 year old man lived downstairs from me last year. Got to the end of March. He said, I'm going to skip my kidney medicine because I got this utility bill. It's the end of winter. Paid the utility bill, skipped his medicine. And by mid April, he was dead from kidney failure. That's what's going on in this country. It's inexcusable. So we're calling for an economic bill of rights. That's been on the agenda for 75 years. FDR put it on the agenda his last two State of the Union addresses. Every Democratic administration, presidential administrations, had at least one term when they had both houses, the Senate and the House, and they haven't got any of these rights. Civil rights movement brought it back, the March on Washington, the Freedom Budget, they grew out of that, and then Poor People's Campaign. And the way those people looked at it was they got a black freedom movement's got to lead a movement, an interracial movement of the poor and the working class, because the Goldwater Republicans and the Democratic Dixiecrats were mobilizing a white backlash against civil rights. And they figured the only way black people can, serve this, can secure their civil rights is if we help everybody secure their economic rights. So these white people feeling insecure couldn't be mobilized by scapegoat black people instead of realizing they were being exploited by the capitalists, just like the black people. That was their strategy. And because it failed, as King said, we lost the war on poverty in Vietnam. And he got vilified for coming out against the war a year before he was assassinated to the day. So we didn't get the Economic Bill of Rights, the white backlash won, and now it's in the White House. So this is crucial, too. So think of all the consequences of not achieving those things. We're talking about the right to a job. If you can't get a job in the private sector, you go to the employment office instead of the unemployment office and say, I want my job. And communities plan social services and public works they need in their communities, meet community needs. And then when people aren't working in the private sector, they can get a living wage job working in the public sector, providing what the community has already said it needs. And you know what? Polling shows going back to when they first tried to legislate that coming out of World War II. Majority of American people are for that. What we're talking about in the Green Party are positions the majority of people want. An income above poverty. That was King's big thing. He said the, the fastest way to end poverty is just give poor people money because what are they lacking? Money. You know, I mean, 99% of poor people, they're working hard at, you know, at low wage jobs. They're still poor. So they need, a, uh, you know, more, higher wages. We need to raise the minimum wage. But just if your income's below the poverty line, the government sends you money to bring you back up above it. You can build that right into the tax structure. So a job, a guaranteed income. Housing for all. Our Green New Deal plan wants to build 25 million units of public housing done the right way. Mixed income instead of segregated housing for poor people of color in the worst part of town, isolated from transportation and jobs, and good schools and so forth. Like they do in Europe. They got professionals, middle income working people, and low-income people living in the same developments. And we need to build, now I say 25 million, you know, AOC and Bernie came up with a 2.5 million 
unit tenure program. They call it the Green New Deal Public Housing Program. I'm trying to figure out where they got that number. We got 25 million because there are 10 million people who cannot afford, who are low income, cannot afford affordable housing. And by the federal standard of 30% of your income. A quarter of the people in this country pay over half of their income for housing. Half pay over a quarter. So there's a need for that. So we're figuring if we're going to have mixed income, 40% reserved for low income people, the rest for other people, you need 25 million. The other reason we get that number is you know, back when the Fair Housing Act finally passed after King was assassinated, that was the hard one. Congress said, well, we're going to build 25 million units of affordable housing. The problem was that was like the first dawn of neoliberalism. In other words, privatization. So instead of doing it directly through the public sector, which is cheaper, they're going to do what they call public-private partnerships. Basically, that means the government pays some private developer to build affordable housing if he can make more profit off it than he could if he built it himself. And they're not interested in building housing. They want to do upscale, not, you know, affordable housing for low-income people. And then that didn't even happen because the Nixon administration came in and they didn't want it. Part of the $25 million was desegregation. And Nixon didn't want to do that. So that all got killed. But our $25 million was once on the agenda in terms of the number of public housing units. So that's where we get $25 million. Our Green New Deal is about solving problems, not posturing. And that's what really burns me up because, you know, AOC gave over the planning of a Green New Deal to the consensus uh, think tank. They came up with nothing, just a couple of essays. And then their top people moved on to other think tanks. They're playing with us. There is no Green New Deal coming from the Democratic Party. And the climate is melting down. So inequality, jobs, income, housing, Medicare for all. We want to go back to the old Dellums bill, which was competing with the Kennedy bill, which is what we call Medicare for all, and the Nixon bill, and this is back in the 70s, which became Obamacare, you know, mandates for employers and individuals to buy insurance. The Dellums bill is not just socializing payment, but also delivery, so that hospitals and clinics and other medical resources are under public ownership and control. The doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers are public employees rather than employees of corporate organizations trying to maximize their income and fees for service, which makes cost control hard. And then it's under community control, a community controlled national health service, so that we elect local health boards, two thirds from the public, one third from the healthcare workers, because they, they have an expertise, needs to be on those boards, but it's under community control. So that if you're in a city like mine, South Side's got no doctors, no clinics, people gonna walk two miles to that uh, Medicaid Community Health Center, or up the hill to the university if they got some other insurance. And half the people in that neighborhood don't have cars, so they, they got to walk. The bus system is so bad, you know, most people, they don't have all day to wait for the bus. Um, so we're under community control, that community would have a voice. We need medical resources in our community, rather than all being concentrated up by the university. So jobs, income, housing, health care, education, public education from child care, pre-K, through post-secondary college, trade schools, continuing adult education. You know, down here in New York City, CUNY, the City University of New York, was tuition free from 1848 to 1976. You know, we're a rich country now, and these major party politicians act like, oh, how are we going to afford that? Well, when you're spending 1.25 trillion on a military budget, and you got big corporate welfare for fossil fuel companies and so forth, yeah, uh, you maybe have trouble finding uh, money for real priorities, what the people want. So, jobs, income, housing, health care, education, and then retirement. My generation, stagnant wages, rising health care, housing, and college costs. A lot of people in my generation still working when they should be retired because they weren't able to save. I know a woman, you probably know her, Coley Clark. Last time I talked to her, she got student loans in the 80s. She's an old civil rights worker. She was Medgar Evers' assistant when he was assassinated, got involved in SNCC, came north with King to Chicago when he tried to bring the movement north, ended up going to school at SUNY Albany and took out some loans. She's now on Social Security, and Social Security is, gar I mean, uh, her checks are garnished to pay off student loans. 
I mean, this is, this is just, you know, unspeakably immoral. And so we're just saying double Social Security. So every senior's got an income above poverty. They can retire. And some young people looking for work can take their place and get a job. I mean, Stephen Hill, a green out of San Francisco, developed a whole plan for this a decade ago. It was in the Atlantic magazine and then published in the book. So that's the Economic Bill of Rights. And then the third thing, this new nuclear arms race, the bulletin of the atomic scientists has their doomsday clock the closest it's ever been to midnight. Because the U.S. kicked off this nuclear modernization program under Obama, continued under Trump, the Russians and the Chinese have followed suit. And now we got hypersonic strategic missiles six times faster than all ones. So you no longer launch on warning when your radars say they might have launched. You launch in anticipation because you don't have time to react. That, may, that puts us even closer to an accidental nuclear war. And then they put more tactical nukes than conventional forces with a crazy idea that we can escalate to de-escalate. That's the doctrine, uh, military doctrine of U.S. forces and now Russian forces. And Daniel Ellsberg will tell you that's crazy. He wrote a book called The Doomsday Machine. He calls that his second Pentagon Papers because he was a nuclear war planner before he was a Vietnam war planner. And once one nuke flies, they all fly. It's automated. That's why it's a doomsday machine. This is an existential threat. None of the leadership of the two parties have talked about this. None of the presidential candidates have. We're talking about peace initiatives to reduce tensions so we can go to the other nuclear powers and say, look, these weapons should never be used. Let's negotiate mutual nuclear disarmament. We're talking about a 75% cut in military spending. Getting out of these endless wars, an orderly withdrawal from our over 800 military bases, pledging no first use of nuclear weapons, and disarming our nukes to a minimum credible deterrent. Then we go to these other powers with world public opinion. Three years ago, 122 nations agreed to a new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. They agreed to the text, and now they're just six shorts of ratification for it to become uh, international law. And the international campaign for the abolition of nuclear weapons got the Nobel Peace Prize for that. And hardly anybody in this country knows that. So the presidential candidates, political leadership of the two capitalist parties, the corporate state media for the two-party corporate state, they're not talking about it. The rest of the world is scared to death. That's why they got behind this new treaty. So that's the third issue. And now, of course, we got the COVID uh, pandemic. 4% of the world's population. We got a quarter of the world's deaths. We got a guy who's president who is incompetent, uh, only cares about himself, doesn't give a damn about any of us, who has let this thing, he could have been the hero of this thing. He could have just filed the public health advisors and done like, you know, Europe and the Pacific Rim countries have done. Test, trace, concentrate, suppress the community spread. People go back to work and school safely. And, you know, it'd be around, but it wouldn't be, what we got right now, which is over, I guess we just hit 200,000 deaths or about to, and the epidemiologists say we're going to have 400,000 by the election because it's going to accelerate. You know, this is, uh, you know, just a total calamity. And so people say, well, Biden wouldn't do that. He probably wouldn't. But where the hell has he been the last six months? He's got the stage. He lives within commuter distance of the White House press corps. He used to commute there from Wilmington down to the Senate building all the time. He could have convened them like Cuomo did, got on cable TV, and beat the hell out of Trump. Test, trace, and quarantine. And while he was there, he could talk about saving the post office from the sabotage the Trump administration has done to it to screw up the election, the need for universal mail-in ballot option, which is too late now. They're already, you know, hitting deadlines. Stuff has to be mailed out. So... That's a fourth life or death issue. And then the fifth one came up is, you know, the pandemic of racism that people of color know about in this country. But now that it's, you see George Floyd and others killed in living color on TV screens, a lot of white people said that's wrong. And they came out in solidarity against that. Now, what Angela and I are saying is that we got to go beyond just telling uh, <laughs> mayors and Congress to institute new use of force policies. Because, look, we had an abolition or a law against using the chokehold since 1993 in New York City. And Eric Garner was choked to death using the chokehold. The problem is, is, as Margaret pointed out, the police police themselves. We need community control of the police, so they're going to keep getting away with the assaults. 
in the murders, in the rackets like civil asset for forfeiture. They got to be under, they got to answer to us. So, you know, we have a paper on the website, you know, says we should have elected police commissions, which is what the Black Panther Party used to demand. Although Black Agenda reporters had another brother saying they should be selected by lot like juries, which I think is a good idea because unions are powerful. You could have political influence. The problem with these review boards we got is the politicians pick them. Well, the politicians created these police forces. Why? Because behind them is the real estate industry. And the police are there to police the new the lines of New Jim Crow, the municipal lines, the school district lines, the lines that divide neighborhoods by class. To keep downscale people, particularly black people, down and out of the upscale communities. That's what they do. Only 5% of what police do deals with violent crime. Maybe another 12 or 13% with uh, serious property crimes like burglary and carjacking. The rest is harassing poor people for, for low-level offenses or even non-criminal behavior. And that's why defund the police is a good demand, although there's not enough money in the police departments to house the homeless, treat the addicted, counsel the people with mental issues. There just needs to be a lot more. So what Angela and I are talking about is let's defund the military, and this is part of the Green New Deal, and start investing in jobs, businesses, healthcare, housing, schools, in communities, racially oppressed communities that have suffered generations of segregation, discrimination, and exploitation. That's the way to deal with these problems. I'm afraid we're going to get some use of force, cosmetic stuff, and the police will get away with it. And you know, just on the crime statistics and the police statistics, Vera Institute of Justice did a study a few years ago, and the two things that really concerned me was only 25% of those serious violent and property crimes are ever cleared by the police with an arrest. And you talk to people in the, these communities that are harassed by the police, they're also mad at them because the serious crimes don't get solved. They say, you know, they're around to harass us, but when something serious happens, we can't find them. And I've seen that in Syracuse. And the other thing is, the other statistic was, 60% of the victims of these serious crimes don't report them to the police. And why do you think that is? If you're at the scene of the crime, you might get charged. I think that's what people think. You're a witness or a victim. You don't even want the police involved because you've had such bad experiences with them. So those are five life or death issues. And I might do it on time because we said 20 minutes. You could do a little more time. Okay, because I, I could spend a lot of time telling you what's wrong with Biden. I don't need to tell you what's wrong with Trump. But let me say a couple things. Biden's climate policy is probably worse than Trump's. Trump is incompetent. He's lazy. He, he's not going to do stuff. Biden's people want to frack the hell out of the country for oil and gas. They excuse that by doing, they say, carbon capture and sequestration. Well, guess what? That's very expensive. And to do it on a mass scale, because they're talking about doing that to all the gas-fired power plants, you got to build a whole new infrastructure to capture the carbon and pipe it to where you're going to pump it into the ground and hope it never comes back up because if it does, it suffocates people because carbon dioxide concentrated like that is heavier than the atmosphere. And, you know, that's happened like when it bubbles up out of a volcanic uh, situation in a lake in, in somewhere in Africa. I forget which country it was. You know, it killed several thousand people. And in, in some homes, you know, they had bunks and People on the ground level suffocated them. People in the bunks woke up and their relations were dead. So that's a dangerous thing too. But it's not going to happen because if you do that to gas, it's going to be priced out of the market. So we're going to have gas, fossil fuel burning without carbon capture and sequestration. And then they want to build nuclear plants. I mean, how did that go under Obama Biden administration? You know, I was involved in the Seabrook nuclear power plant occupation in 1977. 1,414 of us got arrested, put in National Guard and raised for 10 days. And there were no nuclear, new nuclear power plants ordered after that demonstration, which sort of sparked an anti-nuclear movement across the country. And they excused not ordering based on the movement, but I think it was really the economics. But Obama Biden said, well, we'll, we'll guarantee your loans. So these big nuclear military and industrial corporations said, okay. So they tried to build six of them in South Carolina and Georgia. This is uh, starting, you know, around 
2012, 2013. And four of them are already belly up for cost overruns and construction delays. And there are two that are still trying to build in Vogel, Georgia. And the only reason that's happening is Brian Kemp, the Secretary of State, suppressed the black vote, stole the election from Stacey Abrams, and is gouging Georgia ratepayers to pay for this thing, keep it going. It's a big boondog. And Biden wants to go more nukes. I mean, did he even look at what happened to the last round? I just can't believe, you know, the only way I can explain it is they are in hoc to the fossil fuel industry and to the nuclear industry, which is part of the military industrial complex. You may have noted that last week Biden said, yeah, I may increase military spending and we're going to stay in the Middle East his way, which is more drone strikes and special ops, less boots on the ground from conventional forces because they got families that kind of build an anti-war movement after a while because people wonder, you know, what the hell are we doing here? I'm a former Marine. I, I know Marines have been down there, young guys. And one of them who's very conservative, I mean, you know, a black Baptist guy that, you know, anti-abortion and anti-gay and all this stuff, didn't really have politics about Afghanistan, but he said, you know, I went twice to Helmand Province. And both times I got to know these farmers, you know, and because the rules engagement, we couldn't fight during the day because they were farming. Then they come out at night and we shoot at each other. And here I'm back here and they are back there. And he said, what the hell was I doing? I mean, what was this all about? He was asking me like he didn't understand, you know, why we were there. And I really couldn't give him a good explanation. So Biden is a mess. And, uh, you know, about the only thing you can say for him is he's not Trump, but not Trump is not enough because we got lack of death issues. And uh, so. Thank you very much. 
Excuse me, we just had a donation of $100 from Ed Figueroa. Awesome. Yeah, and that was in the name of Ramon and Menace. This That's is right. the anniversary of his death. It's in fact Ramon's birthday today. Yeah. Ramon and Menace was our Attorney General candidate in 2014. And Ramon was known as the people's lawyer in the South Bronx. And uh, he's sorely missed, as is two people that helped get my campaign going. Kevin Zeese, my press secretary, he kind of got the ball rolling to draft me. And then before that was Bruce Dixon, who was managing editor of Black Agenda Report. And uh, somebody I talked to about politics for a long time, and he kind of closed the deal when people were trying to convince me to run. So I miss all three of those people. And all I can say is I'm, I'm glad to see younger people stepping up, uh, not taking no for an answer, not settling for less than real solutions because real solutions can't wait. And uh, I want to mention to people that we will be, and everybody here should join us if they can, uh, there's a march for climate justice through racial justice, meeting at the Columbus Circle in Manhattan at one o'clock tomorrow. And we got a nice leaflet here. We're gonna got thousands we're gonna hand out to people there. So we need your help with that. We've got signs. So that's tomorrow. Yesterday, uh, we were down at Wall Street and we called on the state to keep what's been an average of $13 billion in revenues from the stock transfer tax. It's pennies on a trade because there's so much trading now. It's computerized on Wall Street. It adds up. And it almost covers this terrible deficit we got because of the COVID economic crisis. And Cuomo, I guess, doesn't want to offend Wall Street, won't keep the money the state's already collecting. So we were down on Wall Street talking about that. And then we walked up to City Hall and uh, did a statement there as well saying City Council and de Blasio should light a fire under Cuomo's butt to save this city. So they're, they're, the news release is uh, there's some copies on the table back there. And if you're watching online, it's on our campaign website. So that's just to say uh, we're not just out here voting. We're, we're trying to be active in the movements and give those movements voice in this election. Because they're sure not getting represented by the two-party corporate state, both the Democratic and Republican flavor. Yeah, no chance. Yeah. Woo what do we want? Howie. When do we want him? Now. 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 Audience would like to ask any questions for Howie? Yes, could you could come up here? Just come up here so we could just hear the questions. Oh, yeah, because otherwise my projector is not that good. Okay. Uh, Howie, any uh, luck with getting a, nothing, a uh, Joe Rogan interview? Uh, because I think that would really get the, the message across, whether it's with Biden or Trump or not. Yeah, I know our media people have made inquiries, and we heard he wanted to host a Trump Biden debate. And I think Biden said he won't go. So our message to Rogan is, I'll go. And uh, I'm ready to debate Trump. I don't think he's ready to debate me. You know, hey, uh, Donald, when's Mexico going to pay for your stupid wall? <laughs> you know, and uh, how are those uh, bone spurs doing, you chicken hawk? You know? Uh, I mean, we can go on, but, you know, I don't think Biden, when he does debate him, he's going to, you know, that you got to do that to Trump because he, you can't have a rational argument with him. He just throws insults back. I think you can throw insulting truths back at him and make him look bad, but I don't think Biden's up to that. But uh, I think Trump is toast, actually, though, because you just look at the polls. They've been solid since the spring. It's going to be a landslide in the Electoral College unless somehow they mess with the count. And, you know, we were talking about the Democrats going after us. Their message is we we're holding up the absentee balloting. No, they were holding it up by dragging this through the courts. And uh, we were the ones pushing for an early resolution. And you read the Wisconsin case, the dissenting opinion, which actually looked at the merits by the law and the fact we should have been on the ballot. The Democrats think they're going to get more votes out of Wisconsin. Angela Walker, my running mate, ran for sheriff as an independent socialist in 2014. She's a native daughter of black Milwaukee. 67,000 people voted for her. That's more than double what Jill Stein got in 2016. How do you think those people feel? 
about her being thrown off the ballot in Wisconsin. Democrats are depressing the vote by people who see that and say, oh, I'm disgusted with both parties. I'm not voting. I mean, the real reason that Bush got elected in 2000 and Trump got elected in 2016, the first reason is massive suppression of the black vote. Hundreds of thousands in Florida, millions across the country in 2000. And then in, uh, take Michigan in 2016, it was Jill Stein who took them to court because there were 75,000 ballots in Detroit never counted. The Republican Secretary of State put defective scanners in Detroit precincts. And at the end of the election, a bunch of votes hadn't been counted, hadn't been run through the scanner. So we sued to get them counted. The judge said, well, you could win every one of those votes and you won't be the, uh, won't win the election. That was the Jill Stein. The Clinton lawyers were in the court. The judge turned to them and said, you could, you have standing, you want to intervene. And they said, oh no, we're just observing. And then they turn around and they blame us. I mean, so black voter suppression. And then of course the electoral college, you know, uh, you split the center right vote and you get these right wing losers. We've had a solution to that since before Nader ran. Get rid of the electoral college and have a ranked choice national popular vote for president. Problem solved. You think the Democrats would figure that out? Instead, they pick on the little old Green Party and the electoral college is still there. Their projections that the popular vote could be five. I've even seen eight million votes in favor of Biden and Trump could still win because of the electoral college. It's a vestige of slavery times when they maximized the vote of the, you know, the, the slaveholding South. And it got worse. Before it was three-fifths for black people. Then it became five-fifths with Jim Crow. So it even increased their power. And the way things have worked out, the electoral college votes are greater in white rural America than in multicultural urban America. You'd think the Democrats, that's the problem. It's not the Green Party. It's not their problem. But... I think they're not really either that smart or they really don't want to change it. It's, it's baffling. You'd think, you know, like Bernie Sanders finally gave voice to Medicare for All, which polling showed had been, he used to call it national health insurance, the majority of people want it. I don't think Bernie moved it based so much as he gave it voice. You'd think some Democrat would, would get on that one too, but we have yet to see it. But anyway, that's... That's a huge issue. <laughs> that was a balloon popping. Yeah. It was a gunfire. Paul, can you um, oh. say, come over here and say questions so they can, we can hear you? Yeah. Um, could you tell the difference between when the Greens talk about remo repealing all cannabis laws and what the Democrats and Republicans mean when they talk about so-called legalizing cannabis? Democrats don't talk about it. The Republicans don't talk about it. They're doing it. Right. Jeff Sessions wants to enforce the laws. And I don't know what Barr does, but he isn't not enforcing them. He isn't saying, go ahead, your state, so you can do what you want on your marijuana laws. And Biden's against legalization. He even thinks it's a, you know, pot is a uh, gateway drug to heroin or something. And, you know, that's an old... God, that goes back to the 60s. You know, that's that goes back to reefer madness. That's crazy. But Biden is, that's where Biden is. He, I guess he saw Re reefer madness when he was a kid. Well, look at his He hadn't kid. learned anything new. His kid's a crackhead. Yeah, I don't know about that, but uh, all I know is he's, he's against the legalization of marijuana, which we are for. We want to legalize, tax, and regulate marijuana. And then the hard drugs, we want to do like Portugal did, decriminalize them. So if you're in possession for personal use of cocaine or heroin or one of those hard drugs, you don't get a criminal charge. You get an appearance ticket. And you go and meet with a lawyer, a social worker, and a doctor. And they look at your situation, see how they can help. They've been doing this in Portugal since 2001. They hardly, they don't have drug overdoses, deaths by drug overdoses. They don't have street crime related to drug trade. They don't have HIV spreading. And in fact, less people use hard drugs because of that counseling. Sometimes people need drug treatment. Sometimes they need counseling because they're using the drugs to cope with other issues. Sometimes they just need their life stabilized. They need a good job or a decent job. And so actually less people are using hard drugs. And that harm reduction approach we need now more than ever because the opioid epidemic is still very deadly and killing lots of people. 
it's kind of gone off the pages with the you know, front pages with the COVID pandemic. But I was looking at statistics recently, and there was a slight downturn in opioids, but it's gone back up, partly because of this COVID economic depression. And uh, so that's a serious problem, and you're not going to solve it when addicted people are afraid to go to anybody because they got an illicit drug that might get them criminal charges. <clears throat> Any more questions? Um, uh, Pat, would you like to ask a question? Okay. Are you able to walk with us? I agree with everything that you've said, um, all the issues you've discussed. However, I think that a lot of what a president has to do, who's really responsible and intelligent, is foreign policy issues. And I think that we should have more discussion of foreign policy issues, especially because the rest of the world is very disgusted with the United States right now, more than ever. They, they just cannot bear how foolish and problematic all our policies are and, and if we were to discuss more foreign policy issues such as Palestine um, we would get a lot more respect from the rest of the world yeah I agree I, I think you know along with the nuclear issue uh, we people in this country can't even find most of these countries on the map and you know that's probably part of our uh, education system. It's partly just a legacy of our culture, but it's also uh, the mass media is very inward looking compared to you know you turn on these other cable networks from other countries. You know France 24, the Israeli uh, outlets, the Russian outlets, BBC, uh, Al Jazeera. They cover the whole world. MSNBC, Fox, CNN. It's all about us. So we're very insular. And uh, so, you know, I've been complaining, this is the most vacuous, issueless campaign I've ever seen. You know, the Democrats' message is, Uncle Joe's a nice guy and Trump's a big, bad mean. <laughs> and the Democratic message is, Trump's the only thing standing between you and the hordes who are coming to burn down your suburbs. I mean, that's the level of debate. Maybe they debated masks. You know, but Trump is back and forth on that, so who knows? It's it's like we got these life or death issues, and there's no substantive policy debate. And probably more than any other area is foreign policy. I guess they're debating over who's tougher against China. When instead of saber rattling, we got to engage the Chinese. <coughs> Climate issue, China's spewing out more carbon than we are. You know, what, what smart policy do we have to get them to stop doing that? Well, I think the first thing is we got to set a good example or we can't say anything to them. And then, okay, and then of course the nuclear arms race. Uh, instead, we're like, you know, patrolling right up against their coast. You know, imagine if China was patrolling in the Gulf of uh, Mexico, you know, and, uh, you know, threatening us or just showing they could do it. You know, it would be a very different kind of mentality. Doesn't mean they're not issues in the South China Sea for Vietnam and the Philippines and Japan, but with China. But you know, we're not the only power in the world, and we're not the world's policemen. And when we try to do it, getting back to what the question was, even before Trump, you know, these Pew uh, surveys of world public opinion about which countries are the greatest threat to world peace, U.S. has been at the top of that list for a long time, because obviously we're the ones fighting. We're active. We're in, we have combat troops engaged in 14 countries right now, 14 wars. Most Americans don't even have a clue about that. You know, they think Afghanistan, Iran, maybe Syria, maybe Yemen, maybe Somalia. After that, Niger, yeah, it's all over North Africa, the Middle East, and also the Philippines. And we don't even know it. We're fighting wars, and we don't even know what countries we're fighting in. I mean, that's how, that's how right that question is. You know, these issues got to be discussed much more. Um, is there a question back there? Can you come forward? So we take, um, oh, hi. Hi, Howie. Hi. I just wanted to ask, um, 
you know, there's a huge debate going on with uh, the relocation of the homeless. And de Blasio was pandering to sort of the Upper West Side yuppies who don't like to see the homeless on the street. So they relocate them to other districts. Um, and it's incredibly disruptive to like a lot of the families and a lot of the, you know, single people who have to, um, you know, they move to a whole other environment. And, um, you know, it's just disruptive. I just wanted to weigh in on that. Yeah, and you know, I know you're involved with this group, Progress New York, that's been fighting um, De Blasio on his privatization of public housing, the RAD program. I forget what the acronym stands for, RAD. But uh, yeah, people, you know, watching and think, you know, well, we got a, you know, progressive mayor of New York need to look at his housing policy. I mean, they they've done what they call affordable housing, and like. The lowest income units are what? You got to have income of like 60, 70,000? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's like five people in the family on a minimum wage. Right. right. You know, it's, it's, it's not for the, it's not affordable for the working class in the city. And privatizing public housing has made it, uh, it's made it problematic where they've done that and it hasn't expanded housing. That goes back to that public park, public private partnership thing that, the Democrats tried to do in the late 60s, you know, opening the door to this privatization of public housing. So, you know, I think you got a big fight in New York with the Blasio, and we have a big fight nationwide to get uh, housing for the people, particularly now with these, uh, in, the, in this COVID depression, people's rent and mortgage payments are piling up for those that can't afford to keep them up on time. And, you know, the projections from different think tanks are up to 40 million people going to be evicted once that moratorium is lifted. And uh, that's a housing crisis we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And what you describe, I mean, we see, I, I went to the tent city in Los Angeles, the biggest homeless tent city we got. It's block after block after block. People living on the sidewalks with tents. And you get these different ethnic communities, all the immigrant groups, you know, and uh, and they, they form communities on the street because they can't afford any of the housing in the area. And I got cousins in Hawaii, they're telling me people on the West Coast, you know, our governments give people tickets to get them out of their cities to go to a, Hawaii because it's warm. And Hawaii rounds them up, gives them tickets, and sends them back to the states. Yeah. It's insane. Wow. It's not a housing policy. It's like push the homeless away instead of getting them homes. Right. So that's why we got this big public housing program to try to deal with the program and good luck in New York. And, uh, I know you guys are doing a, a sleepover in one of the oh, projects. Yeah. yeah, no, we're, we're doing, um, we're having a, a, pro, a rally and then a sleepover. Uh, we're protesting the U S attorney, um, Audrey Strauss, because she's the one that can put pressure on the, um, mayor de Blasio for violating like the, uh, HUD settlement agreement, you know, for dealing with there's the no home. repairs and there's no, um, you know, asbestos, um, mold, toxic mold in public housing. Oh, so yeah. she's the one that can hold him accountable. So we'll see what happens. I, I got my sleeping bag, I got my bullhorn, I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah, and that, you know, people, I, people, and I'm talking to the people on the live stream, we get this nonsense thrown at us that we're not involved in the movements. It's, it's nonsense. We're involved in the movements. The point of running is to get the voice a voice to those movements that won't be co-opted by the Democrats who give us lip service, but without an independent left, yeah, the Democrats go fishing to the right for more votes and progressives get taken for granted. So that's what we're about. We want to be a voice for the movements. We're active in the movements. And we also want to build the party from the bottom up, elect thousands of local candidates as we go in the 2000s and from there to state office and Congress. That's how the Republicans, you know, Lincoln wasn't a third party candidate. By the time he ran, the Republicans were the second party in Congress after the 1958 or 1858 election. That's what we got to do. And the only reason we're, as far as I'm concerned, a big reason why we're running for president is because in 40 of the 50 states, the vote we get determines whether we have a battle line going forward. And as Gloria mentioned, it's not only going to court with bogus challenges to or to the election commissions or boards of election with bogus challenges to our ballot petitions, it's raising the standard we have to keep our ballot line here in New York under the cover of the COVID epidemic. Cuomo, 
the governor got a law attached to the budget that triples the number of votes we need to keep our ballot right. Used to be 50,000. Now it's 130,000 or 2%, whichever is greater. In a presidential election, it's greater. Would have been 155,000 in 2016. We have a higher turnout this time. Could be 160, 170,000. We've only got that many statewide for Green County when Ralph Nader ran for president in 2000. And I got 184,000 with Brian Jones on our ticket in 2014 for governor and lieutenant governor. So that's a very high standard for us. And this is a tough year. And we got to get it now, not just the governor every four years, governor, president, governor every two years. And if we don't meet that threshold, we got to get triple the signatures. 45,000 good signatures, which means 90,000 in a six week window in the heat of summer. You know, there are other states that have a few more signatures, but they got all year to get them or a year and a half. We got to do it in six weeks. That's why this election is so important. We're fighting for our lives. When the New York Times caught wind of this, they had a headline. Uh -huh. Democrats secret plan to kill third parties. Well, it's not a secret now. So it's really important that we fight hard the next 45 days to get those votes so we can stay on the ballot. So we aren't spending the summer 22 knocking ourselves out to get enough signatures so we can actually run a statewide slate of candidates. And we turn them in in late August, the Democrats challenge. By the time the process is ended, it's late September, even early October. And it's a month till the election. That's what they do to us. So we can't let them do that to us. That's that's a challenge for us in New York. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, Howie, just one more time. Can you explain to the people in the Bronx one more time why they need to vote for you and why and why the Bronx needs Greens? Well, there there's a lot of things to say about that. I mean. In this election, we get a ballot line, then you can run candidates for city council and your other local offices. I guess down here, your local offices are city council, state assembly, which actually is a smaller district than city council, yeah. state senator. Yeah. Um, you don't have local school board elections here. Yeah. You got mayoral control. Mm -hmm. That's something we want to fight. Um, but anyway, to be engaged in those politics, we got to get 180,000 or more votes mm -hmm. in this election. So yeah. that's one way it affects the Bronx. Yeah. And then what are the issues in the Bronx? Housing, health care, climate change. You got terrible pollution, asthma. Yeah, that have, comes from fossil fuels. We have asthma alley right here in uh, the South Bronx. We had the highest uh, yeah. number of deaths from uh, COVID-19. Right. And we've had <laughs> democratic administrations at the federal level, city level, state level, and there is still making people sick. So that's an issue that affects the Greens. Economic justice, environmental justice, peace. I don't know how many kids here have volunteered for the military because it's the only economic option, but you're nodding like it's a lot. Yeah, I, I would expect so. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the issues that we're talking about that affect the Bronx. So, um, and I, I look, if we're going to have the Green Party become a major party and force in American politics, we got to engage the people that don't vote. That's the 100 million that didn't vote in 2016. That's a group of people that is predominantly working class, predominantly people of color, and young. Sounds like the Bronx, which has low voter turnout. Yes. So the future of the Green Party depends on the future of the Bronx Greens. Yeah. you got to organize those folks yeah. in concert with our brothers and sisters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's not just what we can do for you. What can you do for all of us? Yeah. You know, we got to get the Bronx organized. Um, before we go, we want to, Gloria Materia wants to come up one more time and make a pitch for um, Howie Hawkins. And Gloria? Oh, yeah. right here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Gloria Torrin, New York State Green right. Chairperson. Great. So everyone, thanks. Um, you know, as the program's coming to a close first, we want to uh, acknowledge our very gracious hosts here in the Bronx, uh, Karina and Chris. Yeah. And, yeah. and my comrades all from the, from the Bronx Greens who have been helping to put this together and really get the word out about Howie and Angela uh, around the Bronx. And, you know, that's a lot of work. And so um, it's great that Howie was able to come here in person. Woo. Tomorrow, Climate March. Yeah. Uh, 
1245, you can meet us around Columbus Circle. We're going to be marching with Howie, so you can do that. And so just to remind people again, if you are here in this lovely backyard in a slightly chilly September evening uh, and you've donated at least $50 or you're ready to donate at least $50, you will get a Bronx Greens t-shirt original. <laughs> and if you are out there and watching and you've gone to HowieHawkins.us, to make at least a fifty dollar donation, uh, maybe Deborah will tell us exactly who you should contact because you also will be eligible to get an amazing Bronx Green T-shirt. So thank you, everyone. Make sure that you get in touch with the campaign and you volunteer at that website if you haven't already, because we are running this campaign to save our lives. Thank you. Um, yeah, tomorrow, please meet us in Columbus Circus. There's going to be a table for the Green Party, and we encourage everyone to come out and support Howie and support um, um, justice for cli uh, racial, um, for climate justice. Okay, and racial justice. Okay, we thank you very much. Uh, yes, five minutes. Five minutes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think of, of what we could say. Maybe I should go back to the to the ballot access challenges because there's been a lot of news about that, and it's really disappointing to see somebody like Rachel Maro just without her staff doing the homework, get all her facts wrong and say what we're doing is a Republican op, which is a real smear and disrespectful. They didn't talk to us. They just got the stuff that the Democrats are putting out. And, you know, you may have seen, if you saw her segment, they showed envelopes with labels on them. They didn't tell you those envelopes were empty. The spin was that the ballots were already out, the absentee ballots, and we were holding up the election. So I would urge people when they, you know, hear news about the Green Party, first of all, think about the source. Second of all, do your own fact checking because they'll smear us. And the problem is we don't have as big a platform to fight back. So we got to be smart. You know, we got to be critical news consumers. And that's something that all the Greens need to do. We need to, you know, not take the first thing we hear uh, from any source, you know, we need to double check because there's a lot of games being played by both parties. You're going to hear that the Republicans are uh, spending money on us. And, you know, no doubt in the background they do. Both parties look at us as pawns on their chess team. And they're playing games, not just with us, but with all the voters. You know, the people that lost in Wisconsin were the voters. They don't have the green option on the ballot. Those that wanted it don't have it. Party suppression is a form of voter suppression. That was a big point Bruce Dixon used to make. And the Democrats get all self-righteous about this black voter suppression. They haven't been too good about fighting it. Meanwhile, they're turning around and suppressing the vote. 61% of Jill Stein's vote in 2016, according to the exit polls, those voters said they wouldn't have come out and voted if Jill Stein wasn't on the ballot. The Green Party brings new voters out. Our voters are our voters. They voted for us for a reason. It's as arrogant as hell for the Democrats to think, well, we're not on the ballot. They're going to vote for the Democrats. You know, a lot of people will say, the hell with you. I ain't vote for anybody. That's what they're doing. So I think just I want to emphasize that because that's what's in the news at the moment. Instead of, how are we going to end this nuclear arms race that could kill us all? How are we going to deal with the climate meltdown? How are we going to get people the basics they need so that their life expectancies can come back up among the working class? How are we going to suppress the COVID pandemic and recover from the COVID depression? The Green New Deal is how. Yeah. That's the public investment we need. They're talking about trickle-down economics again, whether it's, you know, the endless money the Federal Reserve will give the corporations at the zero interest at the window, the Fed window, or it's, you know, it's a little $600 supplement for unemployment, so there's a little consumer demand out there. That doesn't create new assets. That creates new jobs. And that's been the problem of our so-called economic stimulus all along. It makes the rich richer. 
because they take that extra money, they only buy or create new productive assets the time we need to deal with the climate crisis because the demand isn't there. They buy stocks. They buy their own stocks back. They buy other people's stocks. They buy bonds. They do derivatives. It's all about rearranging who owns what we got, getting it further concentrated. And the trickle down don't trickle down to us. So we need a whole new new, new approach there. So I got off on the COVID pandemic because <laughs> okay. in the economic policy, but I was saying, you know, well, I guess there is uh, COVID relief. You know, they, the Democrats talk about the HEROES Act. I didn't think it was too heroic because when it came to housing, Ilhan Omar had a good bill. It was called Cancel Rent and Mortgage. But the other thing it did was pay that. The federal government pays that. So the little landlord, all the little businesses that deal with property management and servicing, didn't go bankrupt because they weren't getting paid. Community credit unions, community banks didn't go bankrupt because they weren't getting paid. So the money kept flowing through the, through the system during the emergency. That was in Ilhan Omar's bill. And there was also a provision that if any rental property came up for sale, they had to notify HUD, which would then tell the public housing authorities and the nonprofit housing uh, managers that this housing, and they would have the first right to buy it. So you could expand the public and nonprofit sector. It was a great bill. Pelosi wasn't having it. Because like most Democrats, when she came from a real estate family, that's what drives the Democratic machines in the cities. That's why the black deal is so bad for, for housing, for people, because as Gloria knows, she ran against him twice. He's a, he's a real estate creature. He's not a progressive, or at least not the kind of progressive we are. Thank you very much, Ali. Yeah. Okay. Once again, meet us at Lisa Green tomorrow at the Climate and Racial Justice March at 1245 in Columbus Circle. If you want a teacher a t-shirt, Bronx Greens t-shirt, real cute, um, contact at bronxgreenparty.org and sign up on our contact page. And once again, please support Howie, the Working Man's Party. Thank you very much. Yeah.